I want to let you know that some content in my documentary may be uncomfortable. I feel it's relevant and important for me to include content that was difficult for me as it is my journey. It is by no means a part of every autistic person's journey. Many adults on the autism spectrum are diagnosed late in life. No two people with autism are exactly the same, just like no two snowflakes are exactly the same. My name is Scott Klum. I'm going to take you on a journey about my life with autism and what it's like to be an adult getting a late diagnosis. Before diagnosis, I had many other labels that guided interventions. Speech therapy, eye training, tutors, central auditory processing disorder, hearing problems, often at tremendous expense to my family. Bullying started in the fourth grade. Teasing, mental tweaking, a lot of confusion. I thought, why me? That continued on through my junior year of high school. My sophomore year, I got into drinking, lying, chameleon behavior to connect, fit in, to be accepted. It didn't really work, but there was still a payoff. It allowed me to hang out with the popular kids, which made it so I was no longer bullied. It also helped with my social anxiety and helped numb out my emotions when I lost my grandparents. I'm Nancy Klum. I'm Scott's mom. My memories of Scott's childhood are that he was happy. I just recently looked through a lot of our old photos. There's so many of him laughing and smiling. We did a lot of things together as a family. We traveled together. Our socialization was with other families, with kids the same age. It was just a happy time. From the time Scott was born, his developmental milestones were slightly delayed compared to his, what I now know as neurotypical brother. And when he was about two years old and in a preschool, the speech therapist came to us and suggested that she should start working with him, that his uh, articulation and his language skills weren't quite where they should be. But as this continued, I became more and more aware that Scott was not processing language. But it was very difficult to get that across to the professionals. You know, starting in about 2005, We just had a series of, of, uh, of challenging circumstances around us. The death of a close friend's child, the death of our grandparents. We lost three grandparents in six months. My dad, three months later Tom's dad, three months later my mom. And that was a very difficult time. It was. I think especially hard on Scott, but again, we didn't know, we just didn't know anything back then, you know, and we didn't know how to help him process his emotions. For me, I think the greatest tipping point where I knew we were in trouble was when Scott had gone off to college and was living on his own and really started to struggle. And that's when the self-harm appeared. And it was, it was scary. It was hard. Never in my wildest dreams did I ever think that I would be going into a lockdown unit and see my son in a psychiatric hospital. Honestly, the hardest part, I believe, 
was having an autistic son and not knowing he was autistic. And that was tough. 2010, we finally go for an autism diagnosis. But at the time, his psychiatrist told us, we think he has signs of Asperger's, but you can't do anything about it. So there's really no reason to get him diagnosed. But Scott kept saying, I want to know why I'm different. And so we pursued the diagnosis. One of the most profound moments in my life that I remember, and it was hard. I was standing in a waiting room at the uh, clinic where he was being diagnosed. And I knew my son was behind, you know, down the hall behind me being diagnosed as autistic when he's about 23, 24 years old. And across the short plaza, I'm looking at the, the building, the next building, and there is a class, and it's my older son, is in that building, getting ready to graduate from dental school. And I felt so torn between two worlds. Probably the hard thing was, even when we got the diagnosis of autism, because he was in his 20s, there was nowhere to send us. So they gave us the diagnosis. Initially, it was PDD, NOS. We eventually had more testing done, and they agreed, no, absolutely, it is, um, he's on the autism spectrum. Again, it was DSM-4, so they diagnosed him with Asperger's. But, you know, you're sent out of that room and we literally were sent out with a sheet of paper, some books I might want to read, and a list of a couple meetup groups that Scott might want to attend to see if he can make some friends. And that was it. That's all they had to offer us. There were no services. There was nowhere for us to go with a newly diagnosed adult, a uh, young adult on the spectrum. There are pains and gains of getting a diagnosis when you're 24. For Scott, he was well aware of feeling and acting differently than other people, of struggling socially and in classrooms. He will say he knew of his struggles long before he got his diagnosis. Scott says the main gain of getting his diagnosis was having an explanation for his being the way he's been, for struggling with so many things for so long. This made way for understanding why he didn't understand so much about himself, other people and their behaviors, and the world in general. Scott will say he knew something was wrong, his hard time with change, like in a routine or plan, with sensory issues to sound, touch, temperature, texture and taste, eye contact, interpreting change in tones of voice, and even his own feelings. He struggled with anxiety, depression, isolation, and hopelessness. Most of all, his racing thoughts, his zero to 100 emotional mind. Probably the most difficult was what I now know are meltdowns. But at the time, we didn't know that that was a meltdown. We just thought he had a reaction, an emotional reaction, and he would get so upset about things that you kind of walked on eggshells and were afraid to address things because you didn't want to set him off. He'd have a meeting with a, 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 a group leader, he was involved in a group, where he was going to present his project and he got anxious and was running around the building. And I'm thinking, you know, he's like 14 years old, what am I supposed to do with this? Well, now I know that's a meltdown. and. He knows that's a meltdown, and he has tools, and I have tools, and it's not surprising. It's just, oh, okay, well, that's what that is. Not a big deal, but at the time, it was very perplexing. Scott fell into a habit of self-harming behavior in response to his racing thoughts. He calls it a negative coping skill. It would pull him into a singular focus 
rather than having hundreds of thoughts flooding his mind in seconds. His self-harm was seen by many around him, including competent mental health professionals, as suicidal gestures or attempts. It didn't matter how big or little the wound was, no matter where he was taken, the ER, psych hospital, they would almost always say he was suicidal, which meant a 72-hour hold at least. And during those times he spent in those places, he was most often shamed and judged without much compassion or kindness. Yeah, I was just, um, you know, when we first met, we were friends because we, you know, kind of shared similar passion and um, thought you were, uh, you know, it was pretty normal. Everything was pretty normal. And I thought, um, I was pretty surprised when, you know, I think the first time you, you I think you called me and told me you were like that you had cut yourself and had been in the hospital and you and I was pretty sh like shocked I was like it was really surprising for a while you were there we were um you know, together, you know, doing things together. And then uh, when, you know, you started um, self-harming and stuff, you were just really withdrawn, you know, got pretty gone from, you know, us for a while. You know, because we had been hanging out quite a bit prior to me knowing that uh, Scott was self-harming himself and I definitely noticed just a difference in his personality and just the emotion that he would put out when he talked it I think that it was affecting him because he thought like we all knew what he was doing in reality I didn't even know at that point and but i could just see that there was some social uh skills like some lack of social skills going on and then when he approached me and told me what was going on uh that's kind of when things made a little bit more sense and i could just tell that he didn't he didn't want to tell me. He was embarrassed about it. You, you could tell that it was going to affect him by him telling me on my, what my reaction was going to be. And so it was kind of hard for myself, even knowing him for so long, to, to really be myself around him because I didn't want anything to that I would say or do or any action to affect him and, and have even worse uh, outcome with it. So that was definitely, it was a tough thing. And I think that that's as bad as it sounds almost when I kind of, I was like so scared and not, I was never embarrassed about it, but I was just kind of scared about what kind of outcome I could would cause if it was, you know, if we had a bad day of skiing or if you had missed a shot and I had done a really sick trick, like any type of just emotion could affect you. And I think that that's what really separated me and Scott's relationship for a little while. People have tried to keep a safety net around me by not telling me the truth, beating around the bush, or staying quiet out of their own fear. In some cases, like Taylor said, people were concerned that even a bad day of filming could throw me into a downward spiral. I knew that he was going to therapy and he was getting help. And I do, thinking about it, I do wish that I was kind of like there through more of it. And 
and able to help him. It was just tough because I was trying to pursue skiing as professionally and I was on the road traveling so much and Scott was, you know, off away at therapy. So our communications really separated and that's, um, that's where I had to, I had to leave Scott to um, work it out on his own and I, I knew that that was going to be tough and I didn't know what the outcome was going to be. At this point, Scott had moved home with us and he was living with us full time. And our biggest concern, of course, was the self-harm and the self-destructive behaviors. And how do you control that? And we did everything we could think of to help control that. It took a long time for us to realize we were really powerless over that. He was the one who had to decide he wanted to change his life, to save his life, to do the hard work. He made the calls. He made the arrangements. All his dad and I had to do was support him. Absolutely. Medications have been one of the biggest challenges for this entire journey with Scott. What makes it very, very difficult is the fact that it would often take two to three, sometimes as much as four months for Scott to get the proper dosage of a medication. And then it was evaluated for two months. And unfortunately, many of the medications that he was taking did not work effectively. So as a result, you were looking at another two to three months to get off the medication. Along with that issue was the interactions of secondary medications with the primary medications. Uh, as a result, some of the medications, although effective by themselves, didn't take care of some of the other problems associated with Scott at that time and uh, led to some pretty significant side effects, those being tremors to the point where he couldn't film anymore, or barely hold a camera. And along with that was excessive weight gain. One of the true positives over the last several years has been Nancy and myself working with John Garson. What he provided me was an understanding, and he put it into such a simple phrase, was saying, the difference between you and Scott is that Scott is wired differently than you are. And as a result, he interprets things differently. He may show more emotions on an issue than you do, or he may not show as much emotion. But once I became aware of that, things tended to fall into place. I am so thankful that he's here today with us and that he's able to come out and go filming. And I honestly feel like Scott is back to the scooter that I originally met. And I think that uh, it's just an amazing outcome. And where he is today is uh, much stronger than anyone uh, that knew what his struggles actually were would have predicted his outcome to be. Honestly, I don't even like, I didn't even know that he had autism until he had told me about it or until I saw his Instagram page where he said, uh, film or photographer living with autism and I don't let it keep me down. I'm like, that is the coolest thing ever. Like, let's start there. Uh, the fact that he gets out and rips and you really don't, I don't notice it at all when we're skiing. Uh, when, he's, when he's in work mode with the camera, yeah, it's all focus and, and you know, he's flexible, which is something I know that some autistic people struggle with is being able to be flexible and move around a bunch. Um, so I would say that it decreases and or disappears for sure. Scott seems like that's what he really loves doing and seems so happy whenever he's skiing and filming. It's sick. <laughs> One thing that really stands out, Scott films great, but his editing definitely stands out a lot to me. I can look at an edit, and if Scott edited it, I'll know it right away.
boat filmers, if you were film, and you got a hand that shakes like this when you're trying to film, more than likely you're gonna probably, you know, give up on it. But uh, Scooter pushed through it, and like now we're out there filming, dude isn't shaking at all. Totally fine. I mean, you hear it in his voice that he's obviously like got through it and is like getting stronger and everything. So it's awesome to see that. But what stands out to me is Scott is like non-stop filming. Anything, anyone, always hungry to film. It's his passion, it's what he loves to do. You know, I think the filming, having a camera in his hands, skis on, on his feet really, uh, you know, makes him kind of just, everything else floats away or disappears. Wait for you to holler. Yeah, dog. I am what I do. And what you need to do is throw yourself into photography. And I want to look at your stuff. I want to look at your website because I, you want to really put that portfolio out there for people to see. Ooh, nice. All right, how would you crop that? You I, crop crop it? I crop that more too. Not, not too tight. Not too tight. Uh, about like that. Yep. That would be, yes, gorgeous. Okay, let's look at some more stuff. We're gonna work on your portfolio. Sounds good. That's the thing I can do help you the most with. That's a great pick. That's go in your rock climbing file. This was some pretty fall colors. Yeah, that's nice. Probably leave it just the way it is. That's a nice pick. You got some good stuff here. Ooh, pretty. I just wanted to show you one of my favorite photos from this fall. Oh God, that's beautiful. Yeah. Okay. The thing that amazes me is I took that picture of SpaceX through the window of a car when we were going like 30 miles an hour. And it still caught it that sharply. Yep. That's nice. the nice thing about phones these days is you can take a picture anytime. You've got the camera. The best camera to have is the camera that's with you. Yep. What that is, is a boarding pass next to the original IBM card to show that a paper boarding pass on a plane is the evolutionary remnant of the IBM punch card. Wow. Passion. You see, the cattle and pasture is where you want the telly. Yeah. Because you see, because if I crop that, let's see, I kind of crop it. Like, then it gets pixelated. Then again. it gets pixelated, but it needs cropping. <coughs> and that's the problem with smartphones is if you start uh, to electronic zoom Electronic zoom sucks. Yep. You see, that's, I know that. And that is the taxi up credit card airplane gas pump. <laughs> I just thought that was so cute. And it said, and please roll the hose up neatly. <laughs> I just had to have a picture of that. Yep. <laughs> so that's some of my pics. Well, thank you. Oh, and you've got some good pictures there. No, remember, photography comes first. Photography comes first? Photography comes first. Autism second. All right. Thank you, Temple. Hey bud. Hi. How are you? Ready? Watch out. Okay. Photography comes first. Autism second. This is my 
um, art display that I'm going to be selling at a coffee shop in Boulder. After meeting with Temple Grandin, she really motivated me to continue to grow. She was the one who pushed me to sell my photography. At the art show, I sold four of my 13 pieces, one of which was close to $400. During this time, I also pursued work again, where we found ICU2, a company that employed me because I am an autistic person with a skill set that should be a career. I couldn't have asked for a better work environment with my co-workers because they cater to the needs of someone like myself who is on the spectrum. In what ways have I been surprised by Scott? Probably too many for this interview. Um, Scott never ceases to amaze me. He, uh, you know, people around Scott will speak on his behalf, you know, well, he's, he's got anxiety, he's, he's got these challenges. And I, either by choice or by reality, I do not see those things in Scott. Really, all I see in Scott is this strong desire to be as much as he can be, um, to grow and learn to manage the challenges that he has so that they don't impact his professional career and uh, a desire for a full life to have a relationship and have a home with a backyard for his pup and um, you know I'm inspired by Scott. Scott is often the student I'm and I find myself in the teacher role um, in this situation with him quite often I find him to be the teacher and myself to be the student. Scott is unconsciously masterful at showing the way through his eyes, through his photography, um, you know, just when he talks, you can tell when he's engaged, you know when something's meaningful by the way his, his eyes light up or if he looks up and he gives you a smile. And for me, working with Scott, I live for those moments. I live for that smile. That smile to me, uh, just makes everything I do worthwhile. The greatest addition to my life in the last year has been Tupac. He is a miniature Australian Shepherd who turned one this summer. I had my worries about getting a puppy because I didn't know if I was capable of taking care of him. Moving forward, it became clearer to me that our connection was extremely powerful. Not only was I capable of being a good dad, but he has also looked after me. Right here. Right here. We are true companions. Having Tupa has given me a sense of purpose, helped me get more independent, and a companion with unconditional love. I've been filming skiing since 2004. Over the years, I have worked on growing my portfolio and have found that I enjoy a variety of subjects outside of skiing, some of which include other action sports, nature and cityscapes, where time lapses have been a great technique for capturing this. A recent addition to my camera equipment has made it so I can capture movement in an aesthetically pleasing way. In the last year and a half, I've been creating more sentimental film work like this documentary you're watching, or even in working for ICU2, where we create informative and meaningful pieces for autism awareness. I see myself involved less with skiing and finding other types of filming to keep my love for filmmaking alive in the many years to come.
Yeah! My name is Scott Klum. I'm a filmmaker, photographer, editor, and by the way, I'm also autistic. Thanks for joining me on this journey. This is just the beginning.